Hey, Vlad here, devinsideu.com. Welcome to another video. All right, are we ready to do this? It's time to drop the M-bomb. In case you're new to this channel, allow me to bring you up to speed. Until now, we were in the process of building a homegrown collections library in Scala, minding our own business, but then we kept stumbling on monads left and right. My plan was to finish the homegrown collection series and only then create an entire playlist dedicated to functional programming. And so I was trying as hard as I could not to talk about monads so that we can finish the homegrown collection series. So why are we here? Well, because I changed my mind. We're putting the homegrown collections library on pause, but only for a few videos. And the reason is that once you understand monads, my other videos will become shorter because I will be able to explain complex topics in more concise terms. For instance, I would be able to say things like, and because it has a monad, we can simply flat map that shit. WTF, you might ask. Well, I didn't say there would be more scientific terms. I just said they would be more concise. Oh, and did I mention that we will write an entire functional programming library in the process? I think I didn't. All right, before we get started, there are a few things that you should know, especially if you're new to this channel. Number one. Even though monads are not that complicated and could be explained in just a few minutes, we don't take shortcuts over here. So if you're looking for something snappy and super, super practical, chances are that you won't like these videos. Number two, I just said videos, multiple, four to be precise. And yes, they're all about monads. In fact, we will get really close to advanced monads, monad transformers, and even the so-called final tagless encoding. But I'm not gonna create those videos until I'm finished with the homegrown collections ones. Number three, if you are looking for something snappy, then you actually might end up liking this one because this one is even for people who have never heard the word monads before. And if you are one of those people, don't worry. After watching this video, you should have enough context. So even if you get lost, you will still grasp monads by the end of the series. I'm sure of it. Number four, after this first video, we will start from scratch and derive monads from two different angles. So not only will you truly understand monads, you will also know exactly why the signature of flat map looks how it looks like. Why is it called flat map? Why is everybody talking about monads? Why do they have laws and is it really necessary to abide them? And also, why are they so important to programmers in the first place? And also, you will learn a lot of new fancy words in the process. All right, you have been warned. My job here is done. Let's finally begin. So what are monads and what problems are they trying to solve? Monads are a mathematical concept, but don't worry, we're talking high school math here, so you don't need a PhD to understand them. Now, mathematical constructs are usually very well defined and these definitions tend to be very concise and commonly undecipherable for mere models because they're built upon many other definitions. Some of these constructs, in fact, a lot of them, are present in different branches of mathematics and every branch has its own definition, which makes things even worse. So there are multiple mathematically valid definitions of monads. And in addition to that, because monads are so important for programmers and programmers like to attend conferences, write blog articles and create videos, there are many monad tutorials out there. Some of these blog articles and videos don't concentrate too much on the mathematical definitions and try to explain monads with interesting analogies and Instead. The most popular ones are containers, boxes, burritos, and my personal favorite, programmable semicolons. What I like to do in my videos is to concentrate on the problem that the concept that I'm explaining is trying to solve. But in case of monads, concentrating on the problem can be ambiguous because even though monads solve only one problem, this problem can be viewed from multiple angles. I will keep using the word problem though. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna give you a few problems that monads are trying to solve, but you're likely not to understand most of them. And I'm not trying to be arrogant here. I spent more than 70 hours trying to figure out a simple and yet concise way to explain monads, and I couldn't. This is also the reason why I decided to create a mini series of videos instead of trying to slam everything into one, because even though I can explain monads in a simple way to you, it's not gonna be concise. So I advise you to just take in the information from this video, which is concise, but somewhat cryptic. Watch the rest of the series and then come back and watch this one again. I'll try to help you out by making this one super short. All right, are you ready? Problem number one, monads are a mechanism which makes automatic composition of special kinds of functions, whatever they are, possible. And manual composition of special kinds of functions, whatever they are, affordable. I will explain what these special kinds of functions are in just a few seconds. For now, just assume that programming, in a sense of functional programming, wouldn't be possible without them. 
Now, whereas a mechanism for manually composing simple kinds of functions is built into literally every language under the sun, the mechanism for manually composing special kinds of functions is built into none of them. And why I'm stressing the word manual will become clear in the upcoming videos. Now, having said that, you can both manually and automatically compose any kinds of functions out there in most, if not all, programming languages. As long as they have a concept of a function, which most of them do, and maybe a concept of higher kind of types, which a lot of them do. However, most programmers wouldn't bother programming with these special kinds of functions, whatever they are, due to the lack of syntactical support for manual composition of such functions, which makes the price for them simply too high to pay. And so most programmers end up not writing their programs in a purely functional way, whatever that means. Problem number two, in which the need for these special kinds of functions will become clear and in which we will also define what these special kinds of functions are. A regular function, especially in the mathematical sense, takes some input of type A and produces some output of type B. In the functional programming world, a program that uses such a function can observe its output B and process it further. In other words, B is the effect that the function has on the program, which is recorded in the type signature of that function. B is known as a pure effect that our function produces. However, any other effect apart from B cannot be observed by the rest of the program, at least in the strict mathematical and thus functional programming sense. This other effect, or multiple of them actually, are known as side effects. Examples include, but are not limited to, assigning a new value to a variable, or in other words, mutating a variable, printing to the console, throwing exceptions, writing to the database, sending emails, sending requests to other services, and so on. Note that most of these examples are useful to most programs, but since a functional program cannot observe side effects, Functions that produce those side effects are useless to functional programmers. And so functional programmers don't write their programs with functions that produce side effects. A special kind of function is used instead, which attaches additional information to the output B, which describes the side effect. The side effect thus becomes a pure effect. So whereas a regular function takes some A and produces a B, a special kind of function takes some A and produces a B wrapped into something which contains this extra information. And by the way, this is where the container, box, and burrito analogies come from. Now in category theory, which is one of the most abstract branches of mathematics, an equivalent to a function is called an arrow. And these special kinds of functions are named after a Swiss mathematician Heinrich Klassley and are thus called Klassley arrows. They're also sometimes called classly functions or even monadic functions because monads are involved during the process of composing such functions, which is also called classly composition. Now, whereas regular function composition is always the same, and this is also the reason why it's built into literally every language, you know, just stick an A into the function and then some B will come out and then take the B, stick into the next function and some C will come out. Classly composition requires an interchangeable component depending on the effect involved. So we need ad hoc polymorphism because we need to change the behavior based on the form of the effect involved. Monads are this interchangeable component. And by the way, this is also where the programmable semicolon analogy comes from. Composition of regular functions is effectively represented by a semicolon in literally every language. Classly composition is a semicolon that can be programmed. So long story short, even though monads don't necessarily convert side effects into effects themselves, they are involved in classly composition, which makes programming with pure effects possible. As a side note, since all effects are now recorded in the type system, they become much easier to track and the entire program much easier to reason about independent of its size. This is one of the many reasons why functional programmers keep insisting on programming only with pure effects instead of side effects and would sell their mother for the language that would enforce the use of pure functions, which are functions that produce pure effects. Problem number three. Another way to describe function composition is to say that there is a common interface for composing functions. And there is a common interface for composing classly arrows, which is called classly composition, as we just learned. And we will see in the upcoming videos how classly composition essentially boils down to the common interface of monads. So if you allow me to hand wave a little, everything that has flat map is a monad. And classly composition works with 
any monad. All right, so this was just an introduction to the entire monad series. And again, I cannot stress this enough. It was not my intention for you to fully grasp the importance of monad or even to understand what they are or what problems they are trying to solve. If you want to gain the full understanding of monads, please consider watching the entire mini series and then come back and watch this video again. In fact, consider rewatching the entire series several times. I'm sure that each time you will find some new insights. Keep in mind that monads aren't really that complicated. They just require a bit of background knowledge from all over the place and there's a bunch of new fancy words involved, but it's really not that complicated. Oh, and by the way, there will be a lot of parametric polymorphism involved with a sprinkle of implicits. And I already have videos about these topics, so you might wanna brush up on your knowledge in these areas. Even though it's not strictly required, I'll try as hard as I can to explain everything as we move along. All right, it's been Vlad, devinsideyou.com. Like this video if you did, subscribe if you wanna improve the developer inside you. If you find my videos valuable, consider supporting me on Patreon. And most importantly, take care.